Methods webinar, Seven Steps to Incorporating Authentic Research into Programming for Your Gifted and Talented Students. Uh, Virginia and Cindy are very excited to offer today's presentation and look forward to engaging with everyone. My name is Carol Mahoney and I'm going to be serving today as your moderator. I'm going to skip over the housekeeping items and we're going to go right into our introduction of Cindy and Virginia. So I'm really excited to introduce our presenters today. Cindy Nottage and Virginia Morris are founders of Active Learning Systems and the developers of the Independent Investigation Method, a process research process for students in grades K through 12, known internationally as IIM. For over 16 years, Virginia and Cindy have been providing teachers throughout the world with proven strategies and teacher-created units, and model the process for educators, showing them how to teach these critical skills to all students, meet state standards, and encourage critical thinking. They bring years of experience to their seminars and the belief that all students really can do research without copying. Please welcome Cindy and Virginia. Hi, um, I'm Cindy, and Virginia and I are really looking forward to sharing our GT experience and research model with all of you. And I'm Virginia. Cindy and I are both teachers, just like many of you. As a matter of fact, we recognize many names from the attendance list. So to those of you who know IIM and those who are new, we welcome you here today. Just today, we have an email that would um, be pleasing to the folks in Alvin, Texas, and maybe some of the rest of you in Texas. Um, Alvin has approved this one-hour webinar as one-hour credit towards your GT update. That might work for some of the rest of you. So um, you can take that back to the powers that be and see if that would um, be covered for your GT update. Yes, Cindy and I are teachers, and before our educational consulting days, we worked many years in the classroom in all grade levels from K through 8, in the regular classroom, in special ed, we even did some college ag adjunct faculty teaching. However, it was way back in 1985 for our new jobs when we began to design the Gifted and Challenges program for our, two, our, our small two-town district in New Hampshire that we became involved in developing a research model we're going to share with you today. We had a number of challenges as we began to develop this program from scratch. How would we identify our students? What would be our program model and how would we implement that model? What was the cost to the district? What kind of a budget do we have to function with? And any school system would need to make the decisions about these areas. These are three areas for which we invite your questions. Please write them in any time, and with Carol's help, we'll field these questions as we go along or answer them at the end of the session. We're now in our 16th year of consulting. We've seen just about as many different designs for GT programs as there are for as there are schools, but back in 1985, there was no GT mandate here in New Hampshire, so we looked to the University of Connecticut for a program model. Their Summer Gifted and Talented Institute is called Confritute. It was envisioned and developed by Dr. Renzulli, and this program model was the one that we studied, and it became the springboard for the design and implementation of our own GT program. So what were our challenges, and how did IIM, our independent investigation method, come to our rescue? Well, that's what this um, hour is all about. Just a little bit about the beginning of our program, because some of you have asked, us, asked about starting up a program. We went home from the first summer at Confitute, armed with a foundation of what our program would be, and with an identification matrix to find our students for the program. We called it Expanding Horizons. We identified students who were highly capable in both math and reading, and they left one math and one reading period per week to spend in the Expanding Horizons room. So each student had two sessions of 30 to 45 minutes. We were eager to challenge these students with critical and creative thinking skills. 
So we decided to use this limited time with them focused on independent studies. We were sure that interdisciplinary, inquiry-based um, studies would be a way to allow the gifted students to explore and express themselves. Only they got stuck. This one couldn't choose a topic. That one couldn't find good resources. Most did not know how to use those resources appropriately once they found them. So Cindy, tell your story about the young lady who wanted to study Conestoga wagons. I had a third grader. I was working with my second and third graders. Off to the library they went. Um, her topic was Conestoga wagons. And she came back with this book that she started looking through. It was definitely too much, too hard for her. And she came up to me and she said, you know what, there's nothing in this book, even though the book was called something like The Westward Movement on Covered Wagons. So she just didn't know how to get into the materials and find what she wanted to know. When the students had finished their research, they thought they had to write a report. And we were really looking for exciting action products. So our first year was fun. But we felt that it was more of a gifted and talented club than a real, uh, a rigorous gifted and talented program. So that was frustrating for us. And how would we describe our students that first year? They were inefficient. They certainly were not independent. And they did a lot of surface research. The next summer, we went back to Compertute. And we began what we called our own type three. And that is um, the investigation of a real problem. And ours was to start supporting our students. This time we had some new information and a firm belief. The new information was that our students, even our most capable ones, didn't understand that research is a process. It's a series of skills that they need to master, a broad set of skills for the versatility they needed to conduct research in any academic area. And we believe in empowering students. We believe in students as independent learners. We wanted to be sure that they were lifelong, critical, and creative thinkers. So this time, we worked on how to support our students in any research assignment with rigor and the skills required. And we began to put together a model that would fit our students' needs. Thus began our own research project. And you will see that um, as we brought this back to our classes, we called it the independent investigation method. And you've got a little preview here, a little sneak peek at what the first cover of our teacher manual looked like in our student pages. Um, it was hand drawn and run off on the Rizzo machine. What a difference equipping students with a research process made. We muddled through a bit at first, but we continued to strengthen the model we had designed. And soon our students really were functioning independently and producing exemplary products. It didn't happen all at once. It wasn't a miracle, but it was astounding the change from what we had first experienced. Our students then took those skills back to the regular classroom where they spent most of their time and began to apply those in the classroom. Our teachers were getting excited because they said these are skills that are good for all students. And that began the school-wide implementation of IIM. So Virginia, this might be a good place to ask this question that one teacher wanted to know. How does this work with one or two advanced students doing this in a regular classroom? Well, the easiest answer is that when the students know the process, they can work independently at any time. But for our students, now we're talking the K through 5 elementary school, the teachers were beginning to teach the research process to all their students. And then differentiation was almost intuitive. So what books they chose for resources, ones that they could actually manage, unlike the Conestoga wagons, uh, story that we heard. And um, they learned to do simple bibliographies. They organized their data. And they made products that they could do at their own skill level. 
in the meantime, the students from our gifted and talented classes used the more advanced skills they learned in their pullout with us, and they were able to work in their regular classrooms more independently, proficiently, and with greater depth of understanding. After several years, our students were moving on to the middle school, and it was time for us to spiral up the skills that they'd learned in the elementary school and expand them into secondary skills. So this became not just a K-5, but a K-12 process, and actually beyond into college. We began to publish materials for our colleagues and our students and for the parents. So here is our K-12 manual that has materials for teachers and for students. Here's the parent guide to raising researchers, some support for parents, and here's one of the many supports for the students, a poster that gets hung in the room. It's cost effective. It works, or Cindy and I wouldn't be here. And more importantly, it gives the students the college and career skills that they need and that is the focus right now. So we had lots of questions about different program models. Whether your program is essentially open-ended and unstructured, or a highly structured program, or even if you're in a GT school, you will be able to incorporate this method. It's both teacher and student friendly. So Virginia, we have one other question that came in too, um, that she's basically asking, a lot of research now is kind of like a summarized book report. How does IIIM help students do authentic research? We're not looking for a book report. We're not looking for fact gathering. Those all have their purpose, um, but that's not what research is. Research is question driven, and it is um, gathering information from a variety of resource types, organizing it, analyzing and synthesizing it for a new end product. So as we go through step by step, I think um, this, the person who asked this question uh, you will get a chance to see the different places in the seven steps where students are, are um, required to use a variety of resources and really do that organizing, thinking, and synthesizing so that they have a research end product, not a book report, and not just fact gathering. Let's fast forward to the CCSS and for those of you in Texas, the TEKS. We were amazed to see how directly the skills we had identified so long ago really as essential components of the research process aligned with what we call the new standards. This is why we've continued to work to spread the IIM model. We believe in empowering the students as independent learners, and we are sure that this skill set will um, give them the college and career readiness skills that they need. About four out of the five mornings a week in this office, Cindy comes in with an article that she's cut out of the newspaper, and it's always, look at this, see how it applies to what our students are learning with IIM. So here's one example. Ah, I should have showed this before. We're going to do Cindy's example in a minute. I forgot to say that as the um, model built moment, momentum, it went not only beyond our school and our state, but it became a um, nationwide program and then an international program. And this is a quote from one of the teachers that I worked with when I was teaching 60 women in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, how to do the IIM model. And she was working on her master's. And as you can see, she had learned it with me that summer, and she was applying it to her master's and into her PhD study. So this is really a national and an international model. And now we have Cindy's quote from the Boston Globe. So every week, every day, practically, you can see uh, these types of articles. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir here. But what they're saying is that we're spending too much time on prep tap, test prep activities that don't have any relationship to the real world, as opposed to working with the children to learn how to think critically, communicate, and collaborate. And those are the actual skills that 
children learn when they're doing an authentic research study. Thank you very much. And think about our teachers. We have materials to support you. And this quote shows that it isn't just the students. The teachers sometimes dread the time of the year when independent studies are required. So our materials now are our K-12 manual that I showed you before. Here we have a K-5 manual. This one is No More Plagiarism for Secondary Students and many other supports. But these are the basic tools, and they are all available both in CCSS and in TEACH formats. Here's our model. It's, it's a two-level model. The basic level are the skill set, or is the skill set the students need to get from beginning to end in a research assignment. The proficient level will spiral those skills up. When the students are working in the whole class process, whether they're at the basic or proficient level, they will be learning the skills related to the model. The teacher will be doing lots of modeling for them. So the elementary students or what we might call our budding researchers, everything might be done on chart paper or on that smart board. In the whole class process at the proficient level, teachers would be reviewing the steps of the process and some of the skills that would be um, necessary for students to use when they're working independently. Our goal is for them to work independently so they move on at the basic level to their beginning independent studies. And then the skills at the proficient level are spiraled the same seven steps, but um, more sophisticated skills. Generally, these are secondary students, but some of your gifted and talented students can work at the proficient level even in the lower grades. So one of the things that um, was really exciting to me was that I actually shared the independent investigation method and process with my youngest son, who's a sophomore in high school, who you can actually read his story on the IIIM blog um, where a, a writer is born, basically. And Michael is a um, very special, very intelligent kid, but he gets uh, very frustrated and overwhelmed whenever he had to take on a research project. And he was actually under a lot of pressure to uh, get his grade up in a certain class. And he had a research project due where he actually had to write a historical fiction piece based off of all of the research that he learned. So it was very much designed so that they weren't just doing a book report. They had to be a little bit creative about it. And he had to get um, sources from multiple places. So when I started working with both Virginia and Cindy, um, I introduced the method to Michael and said, you know, this might be something that will help you so that you're not overwhelmed. It'll break it down into a process for you. And um, it also helped me as a parent because I was able to sort of help and guide him through it without being overbearing and, as he likes to call it, nagging. Um, and so the end result of it was is that he had uh, a minimum of 10 pages that he needed to write. And as he started going do, through and doing the research and putting it all together, he was really excited about the project itself. And he kind of started creating this whole story around it. And as a result, his 10-page paper ended up turning into 17 pages. Um, and his teacher was so excited about it that he actually went uh, later on and talked to his guidance counselor. And he's decided to take AP classes next year because he really enjoyed that self-guided, self-motivated process. And when he learned that AP classes were very much in that, structured in the same way, he was like, well, if I can do more of that there, then I'm all for it. So as a parent, I was thrilled. And I'm hoping that it's something that will catch on with the rest of his students and teachers as well. And I think one of the things that's really also interesting about that story is that you know, he's, he's in a classroom um, with other students at different levels. And he was able to use this process independently, even within the classroom, even though they weren't even using the same process. But, I think that may change soon as soon as I meet with teachers or parent-teacher conference soon and let them know how exactly Michael you know, was able to shine in that way. So it's, it's, it's really encouraging to see that. And, and one as a side note, too, even as an adult, and you shared that story with how others are using it later in life, you know, using that process now even as an adult in business um, and in writing my own book, it, it's really been very helpful. It kind of takes that, that overwhelming nature of it away. 
So one of the questions that we got <clears throat> before the, the webinar started was about whether this was a very structured process. When you look at this uh, graphic, it appears that it might be, or if it was a time on task model. It is not. I think that's what um, Carol's son appreciated about it. It's self-pacing once you get to know the model. It is, um, yes, it does have some structure because research is sequential. It's not linear, but it's sequential. But it can be carried out in many different ways according to the uh, teacher's teaching style, the skill level of the students, the learning style of the students. And so um, we see this carried out in so many different ways. Sometimes teachers will say, are we doing this right? If it's working for you and number one, you're not letting the students plagiarize, you're doing it right. So teachers take it and make it their own. So one of the questions is, is it feasible for one teacher to actually implement this process? Um, is it something that one teacher can do, or would they need to add additional staff to do that? One uh, gifted and talented teacher can implement this with, with fidelity if uh, he or she has an understanding of the process, they have the basic skill set down, and they pass it on to their students, then the students can work independently, and the teacher can have confidence that this is a valid model, that the students are following that process and don't need to be overseen every single minute. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a librarian in your school, you have a great co-teacher here, and that can be um, a support system for these students that they go to their um, uh, independent studies and looking for their, their uh, resources. And uh, Carol mentioned blogs. I wrote a blog about onboarding new teachers who had the gifted and talented responsibility. Here's a great way to give them a model foundation as the program starts so that they're sure it isn't just a, a GT club as we were frustrated with, but really an authentic model for students to, to be using. Here are the seven steps. We won't be surprised if you're saying to yourself, these are nothing new and different because they are very familiar terms. What's so powerful about them is that we've shown the students the sequence of the research process. So we're helping the students apply the skill that they've already learned back in their classroom, and we're making sure we teach those skills that are new to them. Remember, our goal is to empower the students to get from beginning to end in the research process independently, ethically, and doing in-depth research on any investigation. Each one of these steps has a combination of skills, but for our short webinar, we've chosen to feature just one key skill and show you the matching, matching standard, either CCSS or TEKS, that goes with that. So we will show an example of how the skill is taught and supported by our materials, both at the basic and the proficient level. So here we go with the research process itself. Step one is, to is topic, choosing what to study. Our featured skill is decision making. Whether your students have free choice of topics or whether they must choose one within the structure of your curriculum, making a decision of what to research is critical to the success of their study. The key skill um, here is decision-making for these young students. And here is a page from our K-5 manual that will help these young students think of some alternatives of topics that they might have and then make a choice that will guide them to a study they really care about. Right here at the beginning of showing the seven steps and the pages we have to support the students, I want to point out that so student materials are a support. They're not a workbook. We do have student booklets at the K-5 to level, or what we call student notebooks at the secondary level. That's what Carol's son was using. And it does the basics of the steps. But it is a guide with lots of instruction for the students. And so there are lots of choices for the teachers, whether they use the student notebook or 
reproducible pages from the manual so that they can focus on the skills that the students need. As long as the model is understood and followed, and I always compare it to understanding and following the scientific method. If they're going to conduct authentic experiments, they need to be following the scientific method. I think we'd agree with that, and the same is true for research. Here is a page from our secondary student materials. You see the tips for choosing terrific topics. This has a voice to the students. It guides them to prompt them perhaps to do some background research that is necessary before they make an educated decision. Student engagement is so critical. So even though you might have identified some very bright and capable students for your program, it doesn't necessarily mean they're eager to work hard or even know what they're passionate to study. It will take some immersion activities, some demonstrations, the presentation of real life problems so that real inquiry-based studies are done. As we said before, there's a place for fact gathering, there's a place for book reports, but not in a research assignment. There are many different skill sets in each step, as I said before. Another one that is key starting in step one and goes all the way through the process is vocabulary development. It helps our students become the experts on their topic and is certainly a critical help to our ELL learners. Once they've chosen their topic, students need to look at the goals that they have for the assignment. It may be teacher goals as well as goals that the students themselves have. Here we're going to focus on the featured skill of developing uh, questions, different types of questions to direct their research. We spend a lot of time on the skill of question development because research is question driven. It's a key to finding answers to asking, asking more good questions and our GT students, all students, but our GT students really need their curiosity piqued, encouraged, nourished. They need to develop their own questions, not chase down the answers to the teacher's questions. We want it to be the student's assignment not the teacher's assignment. Beginning researchers will find that their students frame the study for them. And here is a uh, goal setting page from our K-5 manual. The teacher has framed the study. In this case, um, the study is about dinosaurs. And so these are the big questions that will drive the study. But the students get a chance to ask their own questions related to their own topic. It's also a wonderful place to have a tiered assignment in which different goals that are set for students, although the questions may be the same, the goals may vary according to the student's skill level and interest levels. When the students are more proficient, we're expecting them to ask more sophisticated questions and even do their own research questions to guide their study. For our secondary example, we chose to pull out a scoring guide because we want to remind you that it's really important to assess the process at each stage of the research project. If you focus only on that end product, you're inviting plagiarism, you're inviting glitzy end projects that really the students don't have the process and the information about. And so they need to know that a valid process produces a valid product. And so here, for step two, what kinds of questions did the student ask? Are they good questions? Do they have an action plan? We're going to assess that as the students go along. And then it's time to do research. Here we have two featured skills. One is that students need to use a variety of note-taking techniques and they need to document their sources. And you can see that this, these two skills are very much highlighted in both the Common Core and the TEKS. The students have a foundation now. They've chosen their topic. They know what their goals are. Now they need to go out and 
take the resources that they found, use them, glean the information from them, and record that information. So this is a note fact sheet that our youngest students might be using. Here they are putting their simple bits. They're telling this is their first source. And they're going to write what we call note facts, short, accurate information written in their own words and cited um, on the top of the page. And this is a picture of some of our second graders engaged in their dinosaur studies, each of them working on their own topic. Our second secondary students are required to use many different ways to gather their information. Not only a variety of resources, but a variety of ways to document them. So one of the questions that came in um, when we were preparing for this webinar is, how uh, does IIIM support students' multiple intelligences? Well, a lot of those secondary students want to sit there and go on the internet and Google their sources and never move from there. And we certainly want them to use all the electronic tools available um, to use a variety of resources. But we also want them to take in information in ways that <clears throat> are appropriate to the research study and match their style. So experimenting, doing reading and analyzing charts and graphs, doing interviews, all the different ways to take in information. And we expect them to record them in different ways. So yes, there's a good old-fashioned note card, and that's OK. But of course, mostly the students are documenting their notes on their computer. They might also, though, make charts and graphs of the data they've gotten. Maybe um, they have uh, familiarity with all the different electronic tools that are available now, and they use Evernote or the Google Docs tools in order to document their information, and lots of times required to share that with their teachers. You'll see more about uh, multiple intelligences, the invitation to multiple intelligences as we go through the rest of the steps of the, um, the process. So let's think, uh, before I pass this over to to Cindy, let's think of what the students have accomplished up to this far. We, we've expected them to understand the ethics of research. We're expecting them to use a variety of text and non-text resources. They must validate that these are good resources. They're looking for main ideas and supporting details, all those literacy skills that we've been emphasizing. They're developing their um, vocabulary as they go along. These are all the standards that are now at the forefront of our college and career readiness goals. So once the data has been gathered, the students are ready to write their papers or develop an action product, right? Wrong. This is where Cindy and I fell short from the beginning. Cindy is going to take over and show the critical importance of organizing and goal evaluation before that end product is developed and presented. Thank you, Virginia. So, as Virginia said, we're moving on to step four, organizing. I feel that this is probably the most important step that differentiates between a report, a book report, and true research. Let me tell you a little story about my son, Paul. He's, um, he was uh, in the 10th grade, uh, 10th grade, advanced, uh, English class in honors, writing a research paper. I went in to ask him what, how he was doing that writing. And he said, oh, it's been pretty simple, Mom. Uh, key point number one came from this book. And key point number two, which he told me about, came from this internet site. And key point three came from this source, et cetera. So he had organized his paper by source. The problem was the analyzing and synthesizing of the notes was missing. That's what allows for new ideas to emerge. It makes the information the students own. The sad part is that he got a really good grade on that, but he really didn't come up with his own ideas for it. It doesn't matter when students do this step, whether they are the youngest students who are researching the white-tailed deer, or they're college-bound seniors researching the effects of drought on the economy, 
or if they're in a profession, they're a lawyer organizing ev evidence for trial. Our GT students need the tools to internalize what they've learned and then organize information in, in systematic ways for real world application. So here are some examples. At the elementary level, we can, we, this is a page we use from our book. It can be as simple as identifying categories from their notes, color coding those note facts, and cutting and pasting them into the categories. And you can see these children doing that um, at a table in the library. I'm going to show you a video of a first grader who is organizing his note facts, and he's explaining how he's doing this. Hey, Charlie, what are you doing? I'm organizing my new I love that he organized it by color. Isn't it great? I can't get out of here because my X is over there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I know. The color coding, it's, it looks so simple. Actually, they're using category uh, skills that they've learned in other classes. So color coding is quite com a comfortable way to do it, although I tend to do it myself that way as well. I do too. Um, I'm 40. <laughs> I won't say how old I am. <laughs> Um, okay, so those are our elementary students, and if we move them along to our secondary students, or in our proficient level, what we find them using are the many electronic organizing tools that are available today. What this organizing piece does, whether they're using the cut cutting and pasting and color coding or the electronic tools, it leads to high-level writing. They take their categories with facts that are synthesized from many sources, and they frame topic sentences, main ideas, and details, the very skills that are being tested. These are real-life college and career readiness skills that are used in so many professions. So we talked about test prep back at that Boston Globe article. We're doing test prep here, but we're doing it in a way that's not just on ditto masters or workbooks or whatever, but in really authentic learning activities much more effective. When they finished organizing their information, they're ready to go on to step five, goal evaluation, checking on the goals. So it's still not time to jump to that paper or that action product. This is the step where the students look back at the process. They see if the original goals they set in step two have been achieved, or if there are new questions or in areas that need more information. They also can be reflecting on the role of a researcher, and this is a place where they also might be setting goals for future research studies. It is really important to put this step in the hands of the students, not in the teacher's hands. If you remember Carol's son, Michael, he's a perfect example of the motivation that comes from student-centered learning, which develops independence and self-efficacy, which is what we're looking for in our students. It's also what they're looking for, so they can be motivated and excited about what they're learning. The featured skill is important. We want to be sure that students can retell specific details and draw conclusions from information gathered. So here's an example um, from our K-5 to manual, or K-12 to at the basic level. And it's showing a way that these younger students are looking back, they're reviewing, they're reflecting, and then they're applying. They're reviewing as they look at what were the goals that they set initially. In step two, Virginia showed you the form that goes with this. These were the goals that were set. These are the goals that they achieved. And now they're reflecting and applying as they're writing up their key findings and their new understandings, also looking at their key glossary words and future goals. 
they also, as you can look at those conclusions, if you can really look up close and see them, it says uh, it adapted to its environment by using its head press like a rudder to move towards the fish it caught with its big beak and sharp claws. These are fairly simple conclusions, but this is where our students need to start. When we get to the secondary level, sometimes we use a research paper as for step five instead of step, step six, although it fits into both. Because again, the students are reviewing, they're reflecting, and they're applying. They're applying the skills of sharing information and the conclusions by developing a thesis, supporting it with evidence from valid sources. This is the high-level work we are expecting from our GG students. When that has happened, when they've looked back, they then know they're ready to move ahead to the product, which is what they look for usually as the fun part, especially if it's not just writing a report or a paper, although those are important. Those pieces, types of writing are tested, and they're used in the standards and in your classroom. So they have to learn how to do that type of writing. But the fun part is taking that information that they've gathered and organized and looking at a way to share it that matches up with an audience for their topic. For a paper, the teacher is the only audience, all right? And that um, doesn't really work for students in reality. What they want to know, and anywhere except in school, they want to know what kind of audience will be interested in their product, in their topic, and then create a product that goes with that audience. What that does is it opens the door to so many different product possibilities. I suspect each one of you would find that a poem, a dramatization, or artwork showing the research findings would be much more interesting than a report, certainly for you as the teacher. So this is the perfect place for honoring multiple intelligences and different learning styles. The standards that support the featured skill are asking students to represent information in a variety of ways for specific audiences, knowing that writing can be done in so many different uh, modalities. It's funny that you say fun because when Michael finished his project the next weekend, he said to me, he's like, you know, that was fun. I think I'm going to just do one for fun. And the look on my face, I think my <laughs> jaw was on the floor when he said that. I was like, really? Oh, isn't that what every parent wants to hear from their child or every teacher? OK, so I'm going to show you some that may look like fun, but they're really um, pretty, uh, I think, high level. All right, so here we have a grade 11 world cultures class. Um, the students there decided they wanted to take their information across the street to the elementary school and share their information with those students. So they built kiosks that they could carry across, put up in the gym, and the different classes came through to learn about those different cultures in this way. This one looks really different. All right. So this was a teacher, a fifth grade teacher. The students in that class were studying um, global warming. And they were also learning in their literacy uh, class uh, about persuasive essays, a hook that would get someone to read something that you were writing, and also the lost art of letter writing. So the teacher asked them to find an organization that might be interested in their findings and write to that organization and see if they could get a response. So here's one of the letters that came from a, a, one of the girls in that fifth grade class. And I love the beginning here. Um, I'm going to read it because it's one of my favorites. The polar bear, a strong and solitary animal, waits silently for a seal to come out of its breathing hole to eat. Pop! A seal appears, and the polar bear moves to grab it while using the sea ice as a platform. Suddenly, the sea ice cracks and starts melting. Dinner is lost again. And then she goes into talking about what she studied and what she's asking for from them. Every child in that class got a response from the organization that they wrote to, which is really a very nice thing. You know, your, your audience is listening to what you have to say. This was a project <clears throat> that was done in Massachusetts. And this class has studied the four different towns that were destroyed in order to build the Quabbin Reservoir, the Swift River Valley. And what they did was they put together a presentation for the Historical Society. And this was part of their electronic presentation as well as a pamphlet that they gave looking at causes and effects 
of this whole um, process that affected all the people in their area. Differentiation possibilities within product are endless. Students, as Virginia said, they can self-differentiate. The teachers or the program can do this. So this is the TPSP. It's a component of the Texas Gifted Program called the Texas Performance Standards Project. You can see the Texas website, the TPSP website is up here. Check it out if you're not familiar with it because it has wonderful research projects. Hundreds of Texas teachers have found that IIM fits perfectly into the theme based project. There are two phases for TPSP, and it starts in kindergarten and goes all the way up through grade 12. And there are some exit projects. Eighth grade is an exit year where all the students are expected to do a very formal project presentation. Uh, the theme, the students take a, well, first the teachers work with them in phase one of the whole class process, which goes with several IM for our whole class uh, process. And they model and practice within that theme. And then it moves to phase two, and that goes within our model. So the students will use an independent process either at the basic or the proficient level. They the students then choose their own topic or issue based on the theme. This student used the Titanic and talked about the sudden impact of the Titanic. So I'm going to take you to her product. All right, and so this is the Titanic, and she did a website for a web page for using Weebly. And I'll look at some other product skills that are really important. One is develop and follow a plan. So you can easily see her plan by following along this line. And you can see all the categories and subcategories that she put together before she could put her information in it. Produce final edited documents and projects. So if I go to before the crash and I look at omens, so you can open up any of these and you'll see high quality writing here. So this is kind of an interesting one that I, I got keyed into looking at what the warnings were before the Titanic sunk that told them maybe they should never have sailed. Select and organize and produce visuals to complement and enhance meaning. There's lots of them in here. Let's look at after let's look at the crash and waiting to be rescued. These pictures definitely enhance the writing here, showing what it was like to be out in those um, lifeboats waiting to be rescued. And then use a variety of writing styles. So with sudden impact, the students are supposed to come up with their idea of what was the impact of this at hers with the disaster. And so her uh, conclusion was that the safety, ship safety guidelines uh, were improved greatly. And she put together her own ship safety checklist. If you're going to be going on a ship, this is what you should do. And so this is a checklist, so a different type of writing for that. Lots of different types of writing in this one. So those are the products that we wanted to share. We have lots more. If we had more time, we would do that with you. Um, but it's time for us to move on to step seven, which is presentation. Oh, yes, I have to get up here. OK. Down here. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so step seven is the final step in the process, and it's sharing the new information. Without a real audience, research can feel re really meaningless. Being sure there is one, an audience, for our students, what we're doing is we're setting the stage for really good learning. However, it's really important to train our students in the appropriate presentation skills so they can be confident, both teachers and learners. Some of those skills are using effective speaking strategies, eye contact, voice, tone, volume, pacing, speaking appropriately to different audiences, using necessary presentation equipment, listening attentively to others' presentations. So we're both speaking and listening. These skills are what we expect from competent adults. And they're reflected in the speaking and listening sections of the Common Core, the TEKS, and the College and Career Readiness skills. My true confession is that as a beginning teacher, I loved assigning research projects, but I hated the end results. Because what I did was have the children stand up in class and read their reports. Let me assure you, staying awake was hard, and we were all so bored. And nobody was learning anything. Actually, the kids couldn't pronounce half the words in their reports, so it was really tough. In real life, I know I wouldn't pay to go to a show where everyone was just reading their papers to the audience. 
I like seeing lots of different presentation formats on TV, on the stage, even during lectures. So what, what, are the, what better way to train our kids and to help them learn to present information in various formats, which is our key skill. Here we have Allison. She's our second grade paleontologist from that dinosaur unit. She set up her display at our Dinosaur Discovery Museum. This was our GT program, our pull-out program. She had Pangea. She had all her fossils. And here is her booklet that shows all the work that she did, learning how to be a paleontologist. I love her lab coat. She's so cute, and she it is great. I won't tell you how old she is now, because <laughs> it will age me. Um, these are eighth graders. They're preparing for a dramatic monologue after their study of Charles Dickens. And here are some students, third graders in Alvin, Texas. And they are sharing with their parents what they've been doing with IIM. So I'm going to show you that. Those are great. And you saw the bodily kinesthetic work that was going on there for those children. That's how they were sharing the information besides their, um, it wasn't a wrap, but whatever it was. Um, needless to say, the parents were loving that. And you can see how the students love it as well. So that's the end of our intro to the seven steps of AAIM. Um, and we're going to move now into um, the what we talked about at the beginning, Virginia mentioned, we were going to have three areas uh, to deal with in GT programming, identification, program model, and cost. Um, so. so there was actually one question that came up at the beginning, um, was how did you actually identify your students? You both referenced that in the beginning. How do you, what are the criteria that you use to identify students for this? Perfect. I'm going to move right on to that one. Oh, perfect. Look at that. Absolutely great. Um, and we're, we're going to take, as we talk about these three things, our experiences. As 14 years in, as GT teachers and the remaining years as we've been working in schools all over the country and internationally, we want to share some of those um, experiences with you to help you and to see what's important to you. And so Carol has just asked our question about identification. How did we identify our students? And Virginia mentioned it a little bit. She said that at the beginning we created a matrix that included test scores, behavioral scales, teacher recommendations, to um, parent recommendations. So we got our basic pool of students. But we were a little worried that we weren't finding those students that had hidden gifts outside the identified pullout group. So we started what we call a light bulb program, where every child who they were learning how to do double IM in their regular classrooms, who knew the, the process starting in third grade, could come out and work with us one period a week. Um, and so that gave the te classroom teachers a look at students in a different light, working in areas of their passion, anything they wanted. And we ended up having. Um, new students identified for the program. But one of the really hidden opportunities was our benefit was that parents came forward to show how important that program was. Virginia had a had a parent in her program. No, no. 
Um, yes, yeah, so there was a student who was identified in my pullout program, but her parents had been frustrated with um, lack of challenge in the classroom. And all of a sudden, she was able to put her double IM skills to work in the classroom when they were studying animals. She, Kelly showed up in my room and said, my teacher wants to know if you have any more note facts. She, and so she, I said, yes, how many do you need? How many resources do you need? And she said, oh, about eight or nine. I'm doing a study on um, beavers. Uh, beavers are building beaver dam behind my grandparents' house, and they're going to blow up the beaver dam. And I want to research how to move them so that they'll be safe in the future. So she was able to take those skills back to her regular classroom and um, do really in-depth research while her second grade classmates were um, still using maybe just three resources and doing a very small study. So that was very satisfying to her, to her teacher, and to her parents. So that was the student in, in the pull-out program. There, she, Virginia also has a great story about a parent who had one child in the pull-out program and one child who wasn't identified in that. We've got so many stories. We can sit here and tell stories all day long. I can tell that one as well. So I had a, a student who was in my pull-out program, but when light bulb time rolled around and this gal's sister was in the third grade, she was at, on an IEP. She needed lots of support. But she herself was also able to do an independent study. And hers was cats and kittens. She worked with her SPED teacher occasionally. But she knew the model. She knew the process. And she came up with a really wonderful end product that was a challenge for her and met her needs. So her parents were delighted to know that both their daughters were getting the skill set that they needed at their um, ability levels and their skill levels. Is that the one I was supposed that to tell? Was Those are great stories. Okay. I, I like them both. And I'm going to pull up Kelly in a few minutes again. Um, so that's our identification piece. There are lots of ways to identify. And I think you just answered one of the questions that we had as well, is, is that can this work for either a polo program or a cluster design uh, type of a thing? And I think the answer is yes. Um, and even using Michael again as an example, he was he was actually on an IEP for a long time, and he decided to do this even within his classroom. So I think that you answered your yeah, that question without even knowing it. I did, and it was where I'm going right now: is program, model, and implementation. Yeah. It was a perfect segue right into that piece. Um, so we're looking at pullout in lots of different ways. So children who are pulled out on IEPs and that's probably, this works for them as well. When Virginia and I were working, we actually did GT with both uh, pull-out program. And she talked to you about us seeing our children uh, twice a week, one math period, one a language arts period. And as I moved to another district, I was actually in three different schools for three or four days a week. Therefore, I wasn't really pulling kids out. I was pushing in and working with cluster groups in different classrooms and Virginia's program evolved into that type of program as well. So what we found out was that it works really well in practically any type of program. It doesn't, uh, doesn't matter what it is in reality. Um, what we found out with both of those types of programs, because the children in either one of those programs is spending most of their time in their regular classroom, that the importance of our school-wide enrichment model, which is the one we got from the University of Connecticut, um, encouraged collaboration with classroom teachers, librarians, tech teachers, and other specialists. So that was really important for our programs, that we were working with all of those teachers in many different ways. Um, we loved the fact that we had the connection with the regular curriculum, because the students were doing double IM in their regular classrooms. And it added rigor and independence to those basic studies that they were doing in their, for their regular curriculum. We also were finding, as we were working in either one of those programs, that we, the teachers were learning how to compact their students better so that they could get out of some, some of the work that they already knew how to do. And Virginia brought up this already, the differentiation piece. If we look at Kelly um, in, with her Beaver study, you can see the differentiation that was going on in that classroom. And it wasn't anything that Virginia needed to do as a 
pull-out program. It was happening in the regular classroom, which is what they were studying. So all of those pieces worked great. And then we move on to our final area, which is cost and budget. And we had quite a couple of questions there. Um, so the first one was, and I, and I think we've heard this a couple of times, is can a small district implement this without adding an extra teacher? Right. And we, you know what, we talked about one of them was can you do it with one teacher. Now we're looking at doing it with no teacher. And uh, the answer is yes, limited personnel is a challenge to run the GT uh, program without an extra teacher, but we've seen it done in so many schools using double IM as the focal point program in every classroom. Um, but there needed to be support. So one of the supports that we have seen happening, and it happened for us as well, even though we were GT teachers, the parent volunteers in the classroom. So Virginia, tell about and this is where our light bulb program comes in. And I talk a little bit about the light bulb program. But tell about how your that one year was your light bulb. Oh yes, um, I had students who learned the model in grades one and two. So the third, fourth, and fifth graders were coming in to do light bulbs to the topic of their choice. Everything from uh, skateboards to Elizabeth Bar. I had about 300 students. Uh, not all at once. They came in in sequence, but I had a lot of parent support. The parents were excited, and the kids were really excited. So it really can be ha handled that way um, and accomplish a great deal for all the students in the school. So I just want to read you a little bit from a letter we got from one of the parents that worked in Virginia's um, light bulb program, and I, she worked with me also as part of the pull-out program. She said, the years I spent volunteering for you two have made a lasting impact on me, an adult. She talked about where she was working as a project specialist. And she said, as part of my project team, I facilitate people doing productive thinking, critical thinking, creative thinking, webbing, and even a somewhat modified double IM, but they don't know that. She said, I took a class in process mapping in Denver last fall that was almost like being back with you two in the classroom, except it was all adults struggling with what to do with all their business information. It was second nature to me. The methods taught were almost a business version of double IM. She talks about her daughter. What your program did for her is still a work in progress, but she certainly wouldn't have made it to John Hopkins University without the skills she learned in your program. So we're really talking about life learning skills here. That's exactly what we are. And this parent recognized that and was appreciative of both what she learned and also what her daughter learned. That was before college and career readiness skills were the words that were supposed to roll off your tongue. But that's what they were. And it's beyond college, though. And beyond. Yeah, and actually, right. I like to say the business version of double I am. Right, right. <laughs> she thinks we're going to create that thing. Maybe we should call it the real world version. <laughs> that really would be good. That's great. So um, how can we help you be certain your GT students are getting the research skills foundation they need to be college and career ready? Virginia talked to you about materials that we have. Um, standards based level material manuals for K to 12, support for differentiation, mini lessons, reproducible on the CD, supplementary materials, all kinds of things, student books, um, and even the parent book. We have all kinds of options for training. Um, we have regional trainers. We have specialists in GT, library, primary, intermediate, secondary education, the CCSS, the TEKS, IB are big focus because of the fact that IB is inquiry based. Double IM is fitting perfectly with the IB schools. We offer customized um, training, whole school implementation, specialized audience, train the trainers, parent workshops, and we do consulting for curriculum writing, vertical alignment of skills, and model lessons. So we had a question yeah, about so this. About on the materials part, a lot of uh, people had written in and asked what materials are essential for schools to purchase for this model to be implemented. So the, the essential piece is finding the manual that fits into your school and making sure that every teacher has that manual. Teachers can teach the model without formal training. However, many schools are finding that formal training works really well for them. So that's really, those are the decisions to be made at a school level. But in order to implement the program, a, a manual for each teacher is necessary. 
So that concludes this part of the webinar. There's probably been some questions that have been raised in people's minds. Um, thankfully, we have lots of places to go for some more information. So we do have IIM on Facebook. Um, a lot of the stories that you heard here, like you said, both Virginia and Cindy said, there are a whole bunch of them that they have. We're going to be sharing a lot of those on Facebook, and we certainly love to hear anyone else's stories. They are both challenges and successes. Um, we are also on Twitter at IIM Research. Um, and this is really a more of a place where you can go to find out what are some of the latest trends and things that are happening. You know, obviously IIM was college and career ready uh, before college and career ready was a phrase. Um, so more of that on Twitter. Um, and then there's also a pretty active LinkedIn group where both the regional trainers as well as teachers are there continuing that discussion, um, sharing best practices on, and, and things that students are doing because I think one of the things that I've learned through this is that it's, it's a model and a process that can really be molded and used in so many variety of different ways. And just seeing some of the results that happen with this is so inspiring. Um, certainly contact Virginia and Cindy. Um, you see their email addresses there and their phone number and the website down at the bottom. Certainly encourage everyone to subscribe to the blog where you know a lot more stories are coming out as well as maybe one of those four or five articles that Cindy's finding in the newspapers will probably find its way over there in her reaction to those. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, stay tuned for some future webinars that are going to be happening. And uh, we'll see all of you soon. Thanks. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.